welcome to this week's Ocean Curious interview. My name is Laurent, and uh, today I'm joined by my wonderful Ocean Curious colleagues plus a special guest. But before I introduce our special guest, uh, let's just introduce each other. So, um, uh, or us. Um, Ines, how is everything? Hi, going? everyone. Ines, I W N underscore Alex on Twitter, and I pass it on to Michael. No, I'm there. Hi, uh, Michael James, uh, Ginsburg 5150 on Twitter, and I'll pass it over to Turbush there. Hi, everybody. John Turbush, the gumshoe on Twitter, and pass it to Christina. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Lecate. Welcome another beautiful Sunday with us. And uh, I will pass it on to Laurent to introduce our special guest tonight. So first of all, thank you so much, Griffin, uh, for joining us today. Uh, so Griffin, for those of you who don't know Griffin, he also goes by the handle at Hateless Wonder. So Griffin has been working in the private sector and has done investigations for nearly 20 years. And he has focused on all kinds of um, types of crime. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So I will just kick off. Um, usually we always start off with how did you get into Austin? So what's your story? <laughs> well, um... I got into OSINT, uh, I guess, without realizing I was in it. Um, and I, I have kind of an atypical background, I guess, um, now that I'm more in the OSINT world and I see um, you know, people talk about their own background. And a lot of folks come from cyber or they equate um, OSINT with cyber. And uh, for myself, I, I don't have that background. Uh, I'm, I'm not even close to uh, you know, technically savvy for the most part. Uh, I, I've been doing investigative work uh, for a company which, uh, of course, I do not represent that company in my statements, only myself. Um, but for, for about the last 20 years almost, um, I've been doing investigative work. And I think that that mindset um, just transitions nicely to, to OSINT, uh, the, the curiosity that uh, is necessary for uh, conducting investigative work um, just translates really well. Uh, I've always been somebody who is really interested in problem solving and um, figuring out the answer to things. I just, uh, when I do something that I like, I, I go all out. Like if you ever looked at my bookshelf, I would have entire sections on parts of my life that I was really, where I had like an interesting hobby or something I like to do. Um, so yeah, so I came over to, uh, to OSINT a number of years ago, um, having already been doing that type of work. I actually attended a, a seminar by uh, Michael Bazell. Uh, which everyone of course knows and uh at that moment it just struck me that like this is what i'm this is what i love to do um and i was pretty much possessed from that point on uh collecting uh collecting links to places where i could learn things uh buying books studying watching videos you know meeting people online doing that kind of thing so that's my story really cool Really cool. And a big part uh, of this is also, like you said, the mindset and also the analytical mind, right? Was it something that you learned or do you feel like you had a little bit of it in you as well? You know, I, I think it's kind of always been there. I mean, when I was a kid, the types of books that I would read uh, would be like the Three Investigators books, which I'm probably really dating myself. I'm not, yeah. I, I, people are going to watch this and be like, what is this guy talking about? But uh, they'll find it. It's okay. They'll find it. Yeah, it's a really great investigative uh, <laughs> book series, like a, a like a youth um, level book series. Alfred Hitchcock books from like the '60s, I think. I, uh, I was a big fan. I was reading those as well in like the late '70s and '80s. Yeah, and they're amazing. So I grew up doing that. Mm -hmm. it, it just that's just always been something that really interested me. I actually went to to school to be a police officer. I got a degree in law enforcement and then did not go um, the public sector route. So, Now, you've done a lot of, of sort of criminal investigative work uh, despite being in the private sector. So maybe tell us a little bit about, about how you got into that part of it. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, the company I work for, obviously, uh, uh, lots of private companies that work in um, – you know, retail, banking, insurance, um, uh, intellectual property, they all have an investigative capacity in some way to protect, um, you know, their assets or, or other things. So 
that type of work uh, had always interested me when I was younger and, and also when I wanted to be a police officer. Um, those, those two things kind of go hand in hand. So I found myself with an opportunity to, uh, to go to a company and do that type of work when I was young and, uh, and really never left. Uh, so it's just sort of something that's kind of always been in my blood, I guess. That's awesome. Yeah, I think a lot of us are relate with it. <laughs> I think it's uh, if you if you handle like criminal cases and and also with targets in general, have you seen like uh, is there a more awareness on what Ozin can do from people who are like somehow like not doing nice things or? Do you think, like, for example, Hollywood or what has made these people more aware about, like, how social media or other things online can be, like, a vulnerability? Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, modern times, obviously, we live in a, a connected world, right? So everything has an online component, it seems. Uh, any type of investigative work that you would do, whether it would be uh, for a company, you know, missing person cases, um, other types of, of investigative work, it, there's always some component that, that touches some part of the internet, whether it be through a person's social media or, um, you know, through a website or other information that you can find online about a background. So they just sort of mesh naturally. Um, and it's, it's applicable to so many different uh, careers. That's kind of the thing that it that I like to tell people, and I I'm, sometimes I'm asked by people, you know, how do I get into OSIN or what, you know, what what do I do to get started? And um, I think too many times people assume that you have to be a, a technical cyber type person, and I'll be the first to tell you that I am not technical at all. Um, I, I can't. I mean, you know, view page source and use the uh, the the information in there. Sure, I can do that. It's taken me a couple of years to figure it out, but. Uh, <laughs> That's about as far as I go. If you've got a web GUI tool built, you know, where I can plug something in and click a button, I'm all for it. But uh, unless it was uh, a tool from from GitHub that's built into a, a VM that somebody is uh, literally walking me through how to use, uh, I'm not I'm not going over to GitHub and grabbing tools and and uh, you know executing Python scripts and things like that. It's way over my head. It, I think that's. In, oh, go sorry, ahead, good. Uh, I was just going to say, I think that's encouraging to hear for a lot of people. You know, I think that there is this bias, whatever, that you have to you have to know the command line and stuff. And I think you know it kind of represented even like last year, not this this uh, Sanzos and some of, but the year before there was a lot of GUI and web interface type stuff. And 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 it does. It's it's the creativity of of what you're searching and the questions that you're asking, not so much you know the the actual command line stuff, whatever. So I, I think it's good for people to hear that because. There are divisions in almost every corporate entity that, that do some sort of research from, you know, movie industry to, you know, to uh, financial groups or whatever that, that need to protect their own brand or, you know, damaging content that's outside of that. So I, I think it's good that, uh, that you're here to go through and talk about that stuff because I think it's encouraging for the younger, younger developmental career people that, that say, oh, I've got to learn R and Python and JavaScript and all this. And it's like. No, you just have to go through and dedicate to what you're actually trying to do. So I think that's good. What 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 advice would you give people that are that are getting into the industry, whatever? Uh, you know, what 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 would you tell them to focus on? Well, I would say first off, find some something, some part of your job or some uh, type of industry that you connect with on a personal level and that you can be passionate about, uh, and do that type of work and do what makes you happy. Uh, you know, I'm. I'm 20 years into, you know, adult working life and looking back on it, I, I'm super blessed to be able to do the things that I love to do, um, both inside and outside of work. Um, but I, not everybody feels that way. And I feel bad when I talk to people who are in a job that they hate or that, you know, that they don't wake up every day and join to do. And life is too short not to get super existential here. And, all that, but life is too short to spend time doing stuff like that that you don't love. Uh, obviously, you have to support a family and pay bills and things like that. But if you're early on and you have the opportunity to do so, find something that you can dedicate yourself to that excites you and that's interesting and that you can wake up every day and join uh, and you'll have a much, much happier life. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It's exactly how I see it as well. 
And uh, Griffin, also, like in your free time, um, you serve as Deputy Director of Investigations and also in Team Lead for the National Child Protection Task Force. So can you tell us a little bit about this and how exactly are you using OSINT to inform yeah, this? Absolutely. So uh, NCPTF is first off an amazing organization. I still pinch myself sometimes when I think about the fact that I get to help them do what they do. So they focus on um, missing, exploited and trafficked children around the world, uh, working investigations. And the organization is really only a few years old and uh, comprised mostly of law enforcement uh, folks until really the last year or so. Um, and I joined up uh, after attending their, their conference, um, which, they, uh, which they'll have again this year. Uh, amazing conference, by the way. They put together some incredible speakers and, and great topics, all investigative related. Um, but thanks to COVID, I had an opportunity to attend because it was online. And uh, afterwards, I reached out and I uh, introduced myself to the president, Kevin Metcalf, a uh, great guy. A lot of people in the industry know him uh, and we talked and I think that he probably just sensed that I have a passion for, for this type of work. So um, I, I came on as a volunteer and got myself as involved as I could. I, I really believe in the cause, um, you know, missing kids, uh, exploitation and trafficking. Um, it's just really, it's, a, it's awful stuff. And I feel like I have the ability to, to help people um, with that organization and I have the ability to take something that that I know how to do sort of intrinsically and apply uh, the knowledge and experience that I have to um, something that makes a difference to people that probably won't ever know that I did the work but that's not really the point so yeah no, absolutely. No, yeah awesome. and I think yeah. I think so too there's a an amazing impact that you can create it's truly useful work and it's wonderful and at the same time, you get to see some of the worst of what people do, essentially. And this is, I think, a question that many of us have and many of us discuss in private circles um, when it comes to these types of investigations. How do you balance out mentally with these cases and how do you um, how do you cope with them? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, it it does expose you to some pretty tough stuff. Uh, I, and it's not something that I ever really spent a lot of time paying much attention to before, you know, other than things that would come across the media. Um, you know, I have kids of my own and when you hear about those cases and you, maybe you hear from the parents or you see the things that, that they say after their children disappear, uh, it really tugs at your heartstrings. Uh, it's very, it's very difficult sometimes, but um, I know that, if I, if I get together with my investigative group within NCPTF, and we have some incredibly talented people, uh, incredibly talented, I mean, I am most likely I'm the dumbest person in the room at all times. Uh, so, you know, take that for what it's worth, but uh, people that can do some incredible things, when we get together as a team um, and go to work on a case, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive to see the value that can be added there, uh, and the support that can be given in real time to law enforcement. Yeah that just kind of makes it all worth it for me as far as the the personal connection um or identification i guess with the nature of those cases uh it's it scares me as a parent terribly um but it also makes me feel better to know that there's people out there in the world doing this type of thing and there's plenty of other organizations besides ncptf that support this cause uh, lots of great ones out there that you know people can go and, and support themselves um, so that, you know, gives me a little bit of reassurance, I guess. And I guess it's what they say, you put on focus uh, on the good impact that you can create and on the fact that you actually do something about improving the situation. I think that uh, matters a lot for ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So Griffin, you're quite known for your amazing uh, Start Me page and um, I wanted to ask you, so what would you say are some of the best ways to organize like the tools, the OSINT tools and resources that you've been finding? Do you find that that's the best one? Is there any alternative for those who don't like Start Me that much? Yeah, um, well, I'm a bit of a learning junkie, I guess. 
when I when I like something, I just I go all into it. Uh, <laughs> doesn't matter what the topic is. If I have an interest in something, it's one of the reasons why I'm never going to golf is because if I ever decided I wanted to golf, I would probably be out there all the time and broke because it's an expensive pastime. Uh, so I I collect learning resources for myself. I'm one of those link hoarders uh, that you know people laugh about. Uh, I'm the person that has a thousand bookmarks, you know, categorized a, a million different ways and spreadsheets where I've dumped things in there. I, I DM myself uh, stuff on Twitter and there was so much of it in there recently when I was going to look for something that I had to have Twitter send me my information and wait for that report to come in because I <laughs> sent myself so many DMs. Um, really? one, yeah, I just, whenever I see something I and I want to learn it, um, I want to hold on to it so that I can I can study it. So what I do, my process is, I collect that stuff all the time. And then when I want to learn about a topic, and I, of course I have a running to-do list of all the things I want to learn, right? Uh, I'll take that topic and I'll go find the resources that I've collected and I'll sit down and I'll spend time looking at all of them. Um, and then sometime last year, I, I asked the community, what's the best way for me to organize this mess that I have? And uh, I think it was Nico actually that suggested start me to me, if I remember right, I hope I'm not wrong, but um, I started putting it together in ways that it made sense to me. So I bucketed it with, you know, tools and news and blogs, uh, podcasts, videos, trainings, that kind of thing, um, as kind of a reference for myself. And then uh, I gave it to a few people to uh, to leverage, and people really enjoyed it. So I just made it public and shared it. And um, I guess a lot of people have gotten something out of it, which is great. Yeah, I well, think it's. I, I Go ahead, Lauren. No, I, I really like the approach, and this is exactly what I've been doing as well with my link collection. At first, it was more for me because I liked all of these different resources, and I know I don't need them right now, and I don't need them for every single thing that I do, but I just want to save it for later. And whenever there's something, I always remember, I don't know the answer, but I know it's somewhere here on Startup. Yeah. Uh -huh. and you can find it. So I, I love the, the approach, and also at the same time, sharing, sharing it with the community because they then say, hey, you forgot about this in that website, and then I add it. So it's pretty amazing. Really like I this. think sharing, like you do, just sharing all this stuff is great because I know sometimes you know people have been doing this a long time. You kind of think, well, everybody sort of knows this, but a lot of people don't know it. So it's really great that you have put out your platform and others have as well. But I, I like yours a lot. I think it's well kind of categorized, and like you said, I think a lot of people use it, and it's a great place to go find that one resource that maybe you forgot, you know? Thanks, yeah, I, and I'm not, um, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with, with who I am and where I fit into this whole world, right? I'm not, I'm not ever going to be uh, a super technical person that's gonna blow everybody's mind with some crazy, you know, secret that I figured out about, you know, how to conduct some, a search, right? But I can, I can collect resources and I do know how to organize them in a way that helps me learn and I know that a lot of people are coming into this um, to this industry or looking into this industry, and it's intimidating. There's so much out there, uh, and so many people sharing great information, and so many sites. And I know what it's like to to look into that and say, "Gosh, I don't know. Like this is kind of intimidating." And that could be a person who could really add value to our group down the road, right? I kind of consider it a community, mm -hmm. and if I can help them feel comfortable stepping in or give them a place to look to get, to get started with those resources, then uh, that's awesome. I, I hope I can do that for people. So knowing that there are a lot of new people sort of coming to the field as it were, um, do you maybe have, and you kind of touched on this before, but maybe sort of one or two key things that maybe, again, everyone's doing different stuff in OSINT really, but a couple of things that you would say, Hey, if you're new to the field, like really, these are some things you should look at into yeah for me you have to understand the process um the process to, of an investigation the process of pivoting uh the art of pivoting you really have to to learn yeah. that and and so much of that comes over time with experience right like you, things happen uh subconsciously when you're when you're conducting an investigation because they're they're paths that you followed before and you don't realize that you're following them again um or things that you've learned and you know like oh, i can take that email and i can do this with it or I can, you know, look at these photos and I can find somebody calling, 
you know, the person in the photo by their actual first name instead of whatever their social media name is. But like, you have to learn that kind of thing over time, but you can study things like the intelligence cycle and, mm -hmm. um, you know, investigative processes. And I think that that's important um, to have that kind of built in because it helps with your curiosity. Uh, if you're, you know, for example, a missing persons case, you don't know what you're going to find when you set out. Uh, it's not just, I'm going to go to Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and see if they're on there. Uh, there's times where you have to learn a completely new uh, website, a platform, set of information, area of interest, because it's relative to your investigation. And if you don't take a curious approach to the task and leave yourself open to anything, um, then you're going to limit what you can find. So yeah. I guess that's kind of more of like a, a foundational advice. Uh, don't feel intimidated like you have to go out there and learn all the tricks, right? It's not about yeah. that. I've done I've done some of the, the, the Trash Labs hackathons. I did like four or five of them. And one of the main lessons for me was also, um, and you mentioned this before, it's not about the tools. Uh, there are thousands of tools that you can use. But actually, when I was on the website, so we had a team with a, um, with a, a couple of guys, and then all night we were just literally pivoting, as you said, on uh, from Facebook to Instagram to Twitter. No fancy tools, nothing. It was just literally going through every single photograph and looking at every single detail, whatever piece of information you can find. And then someone else found something else, and then we can connect it and yeah. Find this is what I, what, I, what I love about Osint as well, like this kind of big curiosity uh, and not really about tools and Python here, even though I like, like Python as well, but it's mm -hmm. not really is right, is it? Yeah, that's a great point. And yeah. there's so many great tools out there and I'm not discounting uh, what they can do and how they can assist you. I've always been the kind of person though, that when I, when I work on something, when I work on an investigation or a missing person, I, I want to see all the details myself. I want to read every photo comment. I want to see every picture, the background, the four, you know, who's in it with them. I want to, I want to read the dialogue and understand the relationships between people, <clears throat> excuse me, because the farther down the rabbit hole you go on someone, the more relevant that can be and something will click. Uh, a hundred websites later where you go, gosh, I remember that they mentioned that they really had an interest in this particular kind of car. And now I'm over here on this forum and there's like a similar username here. And I think it might be them and I can draw those correlations. So much of uh, open source investigating is inference. Uh, and that's a slippery slope, by the way, I'm not advocating for people to make assumptions uh, in their investigative work, but you have to take things with a grain of salt and you have to stack up sources in order to validate things. So if you find a birth date in one place, that's a great piece of information, but it's probably not um, a guarantee that that's a birth date, right? So what other things can you use to correlate that piece of information? You have to take that mindset approach to everything. Yeah, it's kind of that analysis that you have to be constantly doing as you're collecting or you miss things. And, mm -hmm. and there, are there are tools that aren't gonna pick those things out. That's why you need to do the kinds of things you do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Especially for people that oh, go ahead. Sorry, Christian. No, it's fine. You can go. Uh, I was just going to say, especially for people that, uh, you know, as we have a lot more social media presence for the people that aren't on social media, I remember there was a missing persons uh, investigation through the trace lab stuff. And, and one of the gentlemen uh, had disappeared and was, uh, was not on a lot of social media platforms as you know, he had usernames and maybe some profiles, but he didn't have a lot of depth to a lot of the stuff. And we had to actually go through family records and go three years back to go through and find where his stuff was. And then once he found his page had to find his, uh, his love of cars, kind of same thing, whatever, but it was only, it was a picture that was posted. So you had to reverse from that, find forums. And yeah, eventually we found a lot of really interesting information. He just wasn't, he wasn't giving it away. You had to go through and dig for him. But those type of persistence and tenacity type of qualities are also, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for, for investigators and pivoting really, really dedicated things, you know? Absolutely. Sorry, go ahead, Christina. How you doing? Yeah, so I wanted to say on top of everything that you guys already said, uh, since we discussed a little bit about the inferences and you said before that you had a lot of other curiosities and a library full of different types of books. <laughs> and I wanted to ask, does the fact that you are a little bit of a generalist, that you have knowledge on other domains and other things, not just hosting techniques, for example, has it helped you uh, with your analysis and investigation, and especially the, the instinct and the inferences part? 
like knowing a little bit about more things than just one. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think it kind of goes back to what I mentioned about uh, doing something that you're passionate about or that you connect with on a personal level that you enjoy. You know, when you when you have that feeling about what you're doing, you always do just a little bit better job, right? Um, one of my other pastimes for the past 20 years is pool. I play pool um, competitively and I have um, for 20 years all around the US and um, I've played people from around the world. Now, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that I'm a superstar by any means, but um, I have an entire bookshelf of books. I have a bazillion websites and videos that I've cataloged and, and watched over the years. Uh, you know, I've, I've taken instruction from people. Um, many years ago, I, I kind of fell in love with the nostalgia of, of built billiards and kind of the golden era of like the 60s and 70s. And so I set out and I bought um, an original Brunswick Gold Crown One table and I took it apart down to the nuts and bolts and completely restored it back to original after spending a year researching how to do it because wow. I, really, I love to do it. And that's kind of the, I guess, what you get out of something that you're passionate about is that sort of attention to detail. And persistence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Griffin, what, what you're saying also about how, and Christina was, was talking about that as well is, how different areas of interest can be very like also useful to OSINT. And one thing that um, that you can always like count on would be to, for example, if you have a, uh, an investigation that's about something related to pool, for example, I would mm -hmm. call, call ask you and would go like, okay, do you know of any good like databases? Is there any <laughs> like forum for pool players? Or it sure is. And, yeah. Yeah. So how how can you how can that be useful in like a day to day research? Like those kinds of like hobbies or like uh, jobs, everything. Yeah, that's, it's definitely possible that that can happen. I, I worked um, a missing person case uh, not that long ago where some information was was uh, shared by one of the other folks in our investigative group and uh, it linked to uh, poker, which was another thing that I was passionate about for a really long time. Um, and I, I recognized immediately that this this person, because they were a part of a certain website um, related to poker, that they probably had an interest to a level that's going to engage them in different forums. And I knew where to look and go to those forums to find information. And uh, this case uh, was supporting law enforcement, so they have the ability to go and, um, you know, serve the legal process on those types of forums and get further information. So that was uh, an avenue that opened up for us because of that type of knowledge. Um, so having niche knowledge is, is really great. I think about uh, the folks that investigate uh, airplanes uh, and understand how to, how to track planes by tail number and, and flight path and do those types of things. That stuff is amazing, but I'm never going to be an expert in that, but I know some people who are. Yeah, I, th I think it's a good thing to, to point out also to new people, you know, who maybe are, are pivoting or, or shifting into this field from some other thing it's not like that other knowledge you have from doing other things is not maybe applicable here because often it is uh, maybe like you said someone is into cars and knows a lot about cars well probably you would be the guy on the team if you're doing some image analysis and trying to figure out what car is there that people would go to so um, right. don't ever think that knowledge you have gained is not going to be applicable in investigations because there's always times something strange will pop up yeah, and it can be extremely useful as well. I, I love that part about also. Yeah, I think about the trace and object program through Europol uh, and the similar FBI program where they release a redacted image that maybe has just an object in it or a piece of clothing or something like that. And, and somebody looks at that and goes, I know exactly what that is. That's a grocery store from my hometown when I was a kid. That's that bag right there. Um, so. Yeah, your, your background and your knowledge is what makes you unique. One of the things that I did last year for NCPTF was to handle their um, their volunteer onboarding process for a number of months. And I get to meet people from all around the world with amazing backgrounds. But the thing that I told everyone is I want, I want diversity on our team in terms of geography and background and experience and what makes people unique. Because if we have a team of Griffins, 
we're only ever going to be as good as I am. And that's a terrible way to operate. If you're in the investigative field, you have to have different perspectives and different backgrounds because everyone brings a unique um, set of skills to the table. So, you know, I'm looking for people that do things that I know nothing about. Uh, I want to learn from them. I want to see how they operate. And I've been able to learn from some really, really impressive people um, on some topics that I never even considered I would, you know, have to know about. But yeah, that's just sort of my approach to, to team building, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree great. with you with this. Yeah, I totally agree. Like bringing different skills to the table, it's just enriching the entire team. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Especially if you have then, you know, let's go another area like uh, country risk analysis or something. You need to have the expert, uh, the, the knowledge, the, the local knowledge, the understanding of the language, the dialects and whatnot, um, rather than just being able to Google what's going on in the news. That's totally different. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Any other questions? No. There's always the last one. I yeah, so questions. <laughs> we have endless questions, but I assume we can also reach out to you through your social media, through your Twitter. Yeah, I love to hear from people. I like I like getting messages on Twitter and people tell me that they read my blog. It always first surprises me and then second makes me excited that I can talk to them. So for our listeners, um, let me just because we've got also some podcast listeners who are listening to this episode. So Please make sure to follow Griffin on Twitter. His handle is at hateless and then one D E R so hateless wonder with a one uh, hateless wonder. This is his Twitter uh, handle. So make sure to follow him and please feel free to also reach out to him. He's more than happy to help. And before uh, we end this interview, Griffin, there's always one thing we ask every interviewee, which is what is the next big thing you want to learn? What is the next thing you want to uh, learn? <clears throat> I know. And I told myself I was going to spend time thinking about this this week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First, yeah. And the first thing that comes to mind is the same one that everyone says, which is I'm going to learn Python this year. Yeah. But, uh, you know, while that is true, um, what I would like to learn more this year is more automation. Um, you know, that's something that I've seen a lot from uh, from Chris Poulter from Olsen Combine, who's an amazing investigator, amazing. The guy's amazing at pretty much everything, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, and, but he does a great job of understanding how to take things and automate them, which is something that I really uh, that I really look, look up to him for. Uh, so my goal this year is to find different ways that I can automate some processes that I have that will save me time. Very cool. Yeah, sounds very good. So thank you so much, Griffin, for taking the time to share your experience and expertise with us. Uh, for our listeners, as I said, make sure to follow him on Twitter and also check out his start.me page. You should be also to, uh, be able to find it in the show notes or on his Twitter account. And uh, if you like these episodes, please make sure to like and subscribe and also share them as well. And uh, if you want to support us through Patreon, you can also do that. And if there's an anything else you would like to say or share with us? I would just like to say sincerely thank you to you guys. I don't consider myself uh, somebody who belongs uh, in a conversation like this with, with folks like you. I mean, you're, you guys yeah. are doing great. You do. I, yeah, no, I, mean, I, really don't, I really don't believe that, but I, I'm super humbled and, and happy we do. to be here. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for all that you do. Thank you also for what you do for the community. I learned a ton from you and from the Osin Curious Project. And I think it's great work that you all do. So just thanks for being great stewards and, and doing what you do for other people. Cheers. Thanks. Great and stuff. Thank you for thanks. being with us. Yeah, thank you. thank you so much. And yeah. Thank you.